So folks, I'm really very excited to introduce today's grand round speaker, Dr. Navdeep Chandel from Northwestern University. Dr. Chandel is a David W. Kugel Pro Professor of Medicine and Biochemistry and Molecular Genetics at the Feinberg School of Medicine. He received his BA in Mathematics in 1991, and then he completed a PhD in Cell Physiology with Dr. Paul Schumacher at the University of Chicago in 1996. He then moved on to a postdoctoral training jointly with Dr. Schumacher and Dr. Craig Thompson at the University of Chicago, setting up his own laboratory at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine in 2000. Now has received several prestigious awards and honors, and I'll just mention two here. He's received the Anthony Linane Young Investigator Award from the Mitochondrial Research Society in 2006. And he, he got an NCI Outstanding Investigator Award in 2016. So now is on the editorial board of several high impact journals, including Molecular Cell and Cell Metabolism. And he's published a book entitled uh, Navigating Metabolism in 2015. He has been consistently publishing groundbreaking work in high impact journals. His research has made major contributions to our understanding of mitochondrial function, particularly to the recognition of mitochondria, not just as workhouse organelles generating metabolites for ma macromolecular synthesis and ATP for bioenergetics, but as active participants in cellular signaling. His work has highlighted the fundamental importance of mitochondrial reactive oxygen species or ROS as second messengers for signaling events that lead to cellular differentiation and to immune cell activation and function. His lab has also demonstrated that mitochondria release the oncometabolite 2-HG or L2-hydroxyglutarate, which promotes histone methylation that controls hematopoietic stem cell differentiation and DNA methylation that controls Treg function. And lastly, his work was the first to show that anti-diabetic drug metformin exerts its anti-cancer effects primarily through inhibition of mitochondrial complex one. So pretty substantial. In the field of cancer, Nav's work has played a major role in con convincing us that as far as tumor growth and progression are concerned, <laughs> aerobic glycolysis and mitochondrial metabolism deserve equal billing. So I will now invite him to tell us in his own words how mitochondria control cancer and immunity. Thanks, Nav. Great, Amita. Thank you for the kind introduction. I assume you can hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. Uh, thank you again for the kind invite, a very generous introduction. As you know, we both overlapped in uh, Craig's la world and lab for a few years, and it's always nice to uh, see you again, and, uh, and I look forward to my, the rest of the day. And so I think you did a really nice job of summarizing the, the key points of my talk, uh, and I'm going to sort of just expand a little bit uh, and give you a little bit of an overview of uh, how we're thinking um, in the 21st century about what functionally mitochondria do. And I'll give enough of a background. I assume the audience is quite diverse. Um, and so the most important slide, uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of um, sort of some vignettes about uh, some current uh, work done by Inmar martinez Reyes and Sam Weinberg. They've been helped by a variety of other uh, students and postdoc in the lab. I had a nice collaboration with Larry Turka, who's a bona fide immunologist who gave us some insights. Scott Budinger, who's my um, friend and current chief uh, and a, and a long-term collaborator and Penga, who helps us do our metabolomics. And so uh, just to get everybody up to speed, uh, you know, uh, when you think of something like cancer, obviously it's a, it's a pro-growth state, and, you know, it's anabolism. Uh, and if you just go back and think about, you know, what are the pathways that are linked to cellular growth? And so from a signal transduction point of view, mTORC1 is sort of the dominant figure. Uh, transcriptionally, MYC tends to be a dominant regulator of pro-growth. And now it's recognized both MYC and mTORC1, they're not the only ones, there are other pathways as well, but they have direct links to uh, either MYC through transcriptional activation of genes and me metabolic pathways, or, a, uh, or the PI3 AKT mTORC1 axis, where mTORC directly phosphorylates key enzymes in nucleotide synthesis, lipid synthesis, et cetera. 
And uh, as Amita pointed, you know, one of the things we've pointed out is that both glycolysis and mitochondria collectively provide the building blocks for growth. And, uh, and I'll highlight this a little bit. Probably the big thing that's happened in the cancer metabolism field in the last five years, which is so obvious probably to most people in cancer, but maybe we were a bit late in recognizing this as a community that, uh, you know, cancer doesn't just happen in a Petri dish where you look at these pathways and signal of metabolic pathways for growth, but you have to sort of think of it in a tumor microenvironment. And this is just a cartoon that I made very simplistic, but it just highlights that in a, in a, in a growing environment, you have the tumor stroma, which can actually provide nutrients for growth for tumor cells. And then there's this sort of this symbiotic or antagonistic relationship between uh, the immune cells and, uh, and cancer cells, uh, and where there, there's a, quite a bit of crosstalk through metabolites. And then the other thing is there's all sorts of pathways that get invoked in a harsh tumor microenvironment where nutrients might be limiting things like autophagy or nutrient scavenging pathways such as macropinosotosis. Many of these pathways, their job is to actually provide substrates for growth, but particular to mitochondria for survival. Um, so this has sort of led to a simple question that my lab has focused for quite a, almost two decades now, which is why does any particular cell type respire? In particular, the cells uh, that are in the immune, um, sorry, in the tumor microenvironment, and these include tumor cells, but also primary cells, endothelial cells, macrophages, Tregs, T cells. Uh, and as a normal counterpart, we look at stem cells, sort of normal stem cells, because these stem cells can proliferate, they can undergo differentiation as a nice comparison to what's happening in cancer. And you'll see this in, uh, uh, in a few minutes. So just to get everybody up to speed, uh, what do mitochondrial uh, functionally do, right? If you ask any biologist, they'll say, oh, the powerhouse of the cell, and that's still true. Uh, so here's the electron transport chain, something that my lab studies extensively. And its major job is to generate a proton motive force, which is used by ATP synthase to generate ATP. That's oxidative phosphorylation, the coupling of molecular oxygen utilization to the generation of ATP. Uh, the great biochemist of the 20th, 20th century told us that one other thing the mitochondria do is uh, the TCA cycle can generate metabolites for growth. So citrate for fatty acids, succinyl-CoA to generate heme, oxaloacetate for aspartate. And in many ways, I would say uh, my lab and many of my colleagues have sort of rediscovered uh, the essential function of TCA for macromolecule synthesis with, you know, with, the, with the newer technologies. Okay, so that's, that's in our textbooks, and, uh, uh, and I think most people now appreciate this. But what's, what's the most exciting thing, I would argue, about mitochondrial biology, and which has really got many people excited beyond, obviously, my lab, is the recognition that mitochondria are signaling organelles. So in the mid-90s, uh, and Amita obviously worked uh, on the BCL2 proteins, but when Xiaodong Wang discovered that the cytochrome C can get released and that was uh, that activated caspase 9 for cell death, I think this sort of broke open this idea and I was completely uh, influenced by this finding that mitochondria are clearly communicating with the rest of the cell. And over the years, there's been a variety of ways that mitochondria release molecules, uh, which can then activate gene expression, inflammation, cell fate, and function. And in particular, the two that we work on is a, the release of H2O2, not as a damaging molecule, but as a molecule that integrates a variety of uh, pathways, including um, decrease in oxygen levels uh, and release H2O2 to activate, for example, the HIFs. And recently the work we've been doing is that TCA cycle metabolites can uh, control epigenetics for cell fit and function. And in particular, we're very interested in two molecules, the release of H2O2 and the release of a metabolite called L2-hydroxyglutarate, L2-AG. And this is a, uh, under uh, you know, uh, sort of nanomole concentrations, we think they work as physiological molecules. As they start to accumulate, they can in incur pathology. And again, we're trying to figure out all the details uh, of how all of this works. But again, this is sort of the conceptual picture that mitochondria can release metabolites or hydrogen peroxide to control cellular physiology, cell state, cell function, but also uh, if this gets dysregulated, it can incur pathology. So probably the one slide uh, that I want everybody to 
uh, as a take home big message. Uh, and if you want to turn off your, uh, you know, the zoom, uh, it's fine because this is the key slide, right? Which is why does a mammalian cell respire? Why do we use oxygen? Why do we have a functional electron transport chain? I would say, obviously generate ATP for cell survival, uh, generate metabolites for growth, right? Uh, so those, all those TCA cycle metabolites can generate nucleotides, fatty acids. And then the third one, which is what uh, my lab has sort of pioneered and we've really been working on is this idea that mitochondria release um, signaling molecules to control cellular state, uh, cellular fate, cellular function, right? And what's fascinating is that if you come and do simple genetic experiments in vivo, where you knock out a particular electron transport complex, the same gene, the same complex in cancer cells, those cancer cells won't proliferate in vivo, which really suggests that mitochondria are, are necessary for cancer cell proliferation in vivo. If you do the same experiment in stem cells that are proliferating, they proliferate fine. They figure a way to proliferate in the absence of a functional electron transport chain. And yet, what they can do is their, their major job, which is to generate progenitors and a particular uh, lineage. Uh, you know, so the impairment is at the level of cellular differentiation. And so uh, the conclusion we've come to is that cancer cells harness mitochondrial electron transport chain. And largely, uh, I'm just gonna stop just for one second and turn off my mic. Okay, sorry about that, um, uh, is for cellular differentiation. And you're gonna see that in a second. So here's a simple experiment we can do. Uh, here's electron transport chain. We can genetically ablate mitochondrial complex three. It has 11 subunits, 10 of them are in nuclear encoded. So you can do classical genetics, uh, you know, mouse genetics with uh, flux alleles. And so this is the experiment we did. Uh, this is a protein, the risky iron sulfur protein RISP. We made conditional mice, RISP flox mice. This is an essential subunit of mitochondrial complex three. If you don't have a RISP, you don't have, you don't have this mitochondrial complex three. Electron transport doesn't work. The cells have to completely survive on glycolysis for ATP. And so when we did this, we got a spectacular finding. This is with Vavi Cre, and this is a Cre that gets turned on uh, in hematopoietic stem cells in utero. As you can see, as the mice are uh, all, uh, they, they die right at day 1920. Uh, they're quite, uh, they've lost their, their red color, their pink hue, and their numbers are way down. The big surprise we got is if we look at hematopoietic stem cells before the mice die, the stem cell numbers are completely there. But if you look at multipotent potent progenitors, so those are what the stem cells make, they're way, way down. And all the blood lineages downstream are all down, right? So the stem cells are there and these stem cells are proliferating by all proliferative markers. They just don't make progenitors. And if you look in the stem cells, those, they have a lot of NADH buildup. So the NAD NADH ratio goes down, right? Uh, and uh, a metabolite that we discovered, which was a top uh, metabolite, well, it was L2-hydroxyglutarate right, in these knockouts, right? And, and so, well, and we've seen this over and over and over. When you don't have a functional electron transport chain, you, you don't regenerate NAD. So let me just go back. So this is complex one, it regenerates NAD. Any of these complexes downstream or complex one, and if that function is down, NADH builds up. Uh, uh, and if the NADH builds up, up uh, then this ratio falls, and then we see concomitantly an increase in L2-hydroxyglutarate. So let me tell you a little bit about L2-hydroxyglutarate. Many of you might know a little bit about 2-HG. So there's two forms of 2-HG. One is the D form, and this is made by the mutant IDH, as many people know. Right, so mutant IDH are sort of neomorphic uh, enzymes that are made uh, in, in a variety of cancer cells, including AML and glioma. The one that I'm referring to is the L form, and this is made by normal enzymes, no mutations. So normal LDH or maladehydrogenases, which typically, you know, LDH takes lactate, maladehydrogenase takes malate as substrate, right? But what happens here is that NADH, uh, when it's high, due to mitochondrial dysfunction and uh, 
is used uh, by these uh, enzymes and they use alpha ketoglutarate promiscuously, right? So instead of using malate, they use alpha ketoglutarate and with NADH and they make L2-hydroxyglutarate. There's a scavenger enzyme called L2-hydroxyglutarate dehydrogenase, which converts this back, right? So the key take home here is that L2-HG accumulates when there's mitochondrial dysfunction, NADH, NAD levels uh, increase. And you can also see these increases during hypoxia, for example, severe hypoxia. So what's so exciting about L2-hydroxyglutarate? Uh, the part that I like about L2-hydroxyglutarate is it can potentially inhibit 75 enzymes. All of those enzymes use alpha-ketoglutarate. L2-hydroxyglutarate uh, is very similar to alpha-ketoglutarate. They're just oxidized and reduced forms of each other. So structurally, they look similar. And so this is a competitive inhibitor of 75 enzymes that use alpha-ketoglutarate these so-called alpha ketoglutarate dioxygenases. Some of the best known ones are the histone demethylases and the TET um, enzymes which participate in DNA demethylases. So if L2-hydroxyglutarate rises compared to alpha ketoglutarate, it will inhibit these demethylase reactions and you will get a hyper histone um, methylation or a hypermethylation of DNA. And if you get a hypermethylation of DNA, you get a down regulation of gene expression. And this is exactly what we see in the stem cells. And so the conclusion we came uh, in these uh, sort of work is if you knock out mitochondrial electron transport function, you make these stem cells purely glycolytic, they don't respire, they will self renew. But what they don't do is they don't differentiate. The reason they don't differentiate is because of too much L2-hydroxyglutarate, which is causing widespread uh, DNA and uh, histone hypermethylation. Okay, so, so, so that's, uh, you know, I hope I can, I've convinced you that the major role is not in self-renewing or proliferation, but in uh, differentiation. If you do this in adult stem cells, hematopoietic, which are actually quiescent, remarkably they lose quiescent and they hyperproliferate and undergo stem cell exhaustion. Again, highlighting that stem cells can find a way to grow in the absence of an electron transport chain. What they cannot do is they cannot differentiate. Is they're needed for cell fate and function. Okay, so let's do the same experiment in these stem cells and put an oncogene in. So we put a notch oncogene, which will give you leukemia. Uh, and what we do is we take our flox mice. Again, here we're using QPC a subunit. It's very similar to RISP. Uh, it's one of the 10 subunits. They're all essential subunits of complex three. If you knock out the subunit, it's exactly like the RISP subunit complex three activity goes down. But here, what we do is we take the stem cells out, uh, we transform them with notch, uh, we irradiate the mice, we let them in graft for four weeks, you start to get leukemia made. And then uh, uh, because the Cree here is a ubiquitous Cree and tamoxifen inducible, we give tamoxifen to knock out uh, complex three function and these stem cells and what you get uh, uh, is, uh, you know, you, you can detect the leukemia in the spleen, the bone marrow, and you can see the weight of the spleen is way down uh, and as well as the positive GFP cells. Uh, and uh, so the notch oncogene, uh, the construct has GFP, so you can track uh, these leukemic cells. But the bottom line is we get a profound defect uh, in uh, leukemia progression. Right? So what is clear here is the same complex three that you knock out in stem cells, it allows the stem cells to proliferate, but it doesn't allow them to differentiate. Now, if you put a potent oncogene like notch, what, what, what ends up happening is that they don't, uh, uh, they don't generate uh, uh, leukemic cells, right? So sort of the take home message is simply that mitochondria's major role uh, is for cell proliferation, while for stem cells, it's not for self renewal, but uh, to have the right signals for cellular differentiation. Uh, and, and really, um, I didn't go through all the details as because the paper was uh, published a few months ago about cancer, but uh, you can read it. But really the major job of complex three here is uh, to allow uh, the regeneration of ubiquinone. So what's complex three is basically doing is, is, is allowing uh, ubiquinone, so sometimes called Q, as a joke, this is not a conspiracy. Um, the Q basically allows, um, it uh, accepts electrons from complex one 
and 2, as well as an enzyme called DHODH, which is an essential enzyme for permitting synthesis. As, as, and so you can dump two electrons to Q, ubiquinone, and then those uh, ubiquinone, by accepting these two electrons from all of these upstream complexes, becomes ubiquinol. Ubiquinol then donates its electrons to complex three, right? It, and, uh, and if you don't have functional complex three, guess what? Ubiquinone cannot pass its electrons. And over time, it cannot accept electrons from these upstream uh, acceptors. So if you knock out complex one, two or DHODH in the same system, uh, tumors don't progress, right? So really it's the ability of complex three to do ubiquinol oxidation. In other words, continue to take electrons from Q. And the reason that's important is, is it allows the TCA cycle to work right, for heme and lipid synthesis, as well as uh, the DHODH function to nucleoside synthesis, just highlighting that cancer cells really like to use the TCA cycle for growth. One other big take home message, uh, and we wrote this last year with my colleague, Ralph Deberdinas, uh, is you know, if you look at our data, Ralph's data clearly suggests that mitochondrial metabolism is necessary for tumor growth in vivo. Lots of other people have shown that, my, that um, glucose uptake and, and glycolysis and it's, uh, it's sort of uh, branched pathways or uh, such as hexosamine nucleotide synthesis and other pathways are also necessary. So the way we think about it is that both the glycolytic intermediates and the TCA cycle intermediates, they're both necessary for growth. Uh, and, uh, and I hope that's one big take home message here. And most tumors, uh, you're gonna get uh, a coordination uh, by mTORC and MYC where you activate both of these uh, big nodes, uh, the glycolytic intermediates, as well as the TCA cycle. And they're both going to be growth. Now, one thing, uh, and this is not really our work, uh, I think Julia Dretta and his colleagues at uh, MD Anderson about five, six years ago pointed this out. Many people have seen this over and over. Uh, the experiment that Julia and his colleagues were doing was they were oncogenically with their nice sophisticated mouse models, they were turning uh, KRAS on and off. So they would let KRAS driven pancreas tumors form and then they would shut off KRAS and the tumors would regress. As they would regress, what they notice is uh, the dormant uh, tumor cells before they took off again, these quiescent slow cycling were very dependent uh, on oxidative phosphorylation and TCA cycle metabolism. And the reason is that a bulk tumor that's growing is doing both glycolysis heavily and TCA cycle. But if you're not growing, there's really no reason for you to take up glucose as most of your energetic uh, needs are done by mitochondria. So they tend to be a little bit more dependent on oxidative phosphorylation. And so they could compare the bulk tumor with these as quiescent slow cycling tumorgenic cells that come out of therapy or, uh, or that are resistant to therapy. And those are very sensitive to uh, mitochondrial inhibitors. And people have seen this with antiangiogenic, uh, tumors that come out of immunotherapy, uh, BRAF inhibition over and over. I think this is another. Uh, and so that of course has led for people like myself to think about, could you target mitochondrial metabolism? And I would say right now in clinical trials, there's three inhibitors that come to mind. One is metformin inhibition of mitochondrial complex one. I'll talk about that because that's the one we worked on. The other one is inhibiting DHODH because that's an essential enzyme in primidine synthesis. Uh, there's an arthritis drug called leflunomide that's used. Um, now there's next generation inhibitors that are much more potent DHODH inhibitors. And of course, trying to figure out if there's a therapeutic window with those. And the other one is uh, Calathera has a glutaminase inhibitor. So uh, this prevents glutamate generation and glutamate feeds into the TCA cycle a lot to uh, fulfill generation of TCA cycle metabolites for growth. And again, the key is to find the right um, uh, therapeutic window, but also which tumors are going to be best uh, served by these inhibitors. And I'll talk about this in a second, but let me just tell you about metformin. So the way, as Amita pointed out, the one of the ways we show that metformin indeed inhibits mitochondrial complex one for its anti-tumor effects. And the reason we got into this was because metformin, uh, the epidemiologist has, had no, have noticed that people on metformin for their diabetes had lower incidence of prostate, breast, and a variety of other cancers. And this led to people to think in preclinical models, they could get metformin to you know, diminish tumors, tumor growth. 
And so metformin will inhibit mitochondrial complex one. And so we wanted to show it was, this was necessary for his anti-tumor effect. Now, the way you would do it for any drug is you, you would find where it binds and mutate at binding site, so it would be refractory to metformin, but not. But the mutation should still allow for normal catalysis. We're not that clever. We're, we're not good structural biologists, uh, so we couldn't figure that out, obviously. But what we did notice is that the yeast protein NDI1 and does something similar to mitochondrial complex one. It regenerates NADH to NAD and allows complex one uh, to uh, to feed electrons downstream complexes. Right. This is sort of our rescue. Uh, and so uh, this is what we noticed. Uh, uh, normal cells with metformin had lower, lower tumor growth, uh, but if you had NDI1, you were largely refractory, right? And uh, what was gratifying after this, uh, I think people started to look at uh, whether this is true in, in, in human patients. And one way you would predict is simply take a biopsy if mitochondrial complex one is inhibited, then the TCA cycle metabolized that is linked to electron transport chain. And as I pointed out uh, in my previous segment, uh, those metabolites should be down. And this is a nice study by Ernst Lengel's group and with Jason Locasal, who's known for his work on metabolomics. And it uh, Ernst is, uh, works on ovarian cancer, a, phys a physician scientist, and Ernst gave Jason uh, tumor biopsies from ovarian cancer. And uh, Jason noticed two important things. One, metformin was in these tumor cells, right? You could detect metformin in the tumor cells and the TCA cycle metabolites were down. Adrian Harris, well known for his work on uh, breast cancer, noticed the same thing that indeed metformin um, uh, uh, was able to uh, uh, inhibit uh, the TCA cycle. And the ones that uh, best re uh, uh, reacted to metformin therapy were the ones which had that profile of uh, changes in TCA cycle metabolites. And they also noticed nicely was that if metformin indeed inhibited mitochondrial complex one, then you should see an increase uh, by PET scan of uh, of the FDG PET, you know, glucose uptake. And indeed you can see here metformin increases FDG flux, uh, right? So that's again, consistent with what we showed in our, our very uh, sort of primitive mouse models uh, in vivo, but we were, we were able to do the causal experiment, obviously. There are two trials. Uh, one is an ongoing trial uh, in Canada, which should come out this year. And again, uh, here they're, they're giving metformin um, uh, in this breast cancer at a, at a, at a dose which is higher than the anti-diabetic dose. Uh, the anti-diabetic dose is uh, about a gram or 1,000 milligram a day. This is closer to 1,700. Again, in order for metformin to inhibit mitochondrial complex one, you have to go to a higher dose. Uh, and this, I won't go through all the, you know, the, the uh, the trial, uh, how it's set up, but it, but one thing I will point out is uh, there's quite a bit of sample size here, and uh, uh, we'll see how this trial uh, reads out later this year. The other one is uh, more a phase two randomized trial, where again they give tyrosine kinase inhibitors, uh, and they with metformin, and and, and there was a. a, a overall survival benefit. And again, uh, there's, I know there's a trial in ovarian cancer uh, being done at the UCSD. One uh, caveat here is this was not designed as a um, double blind study. So again, I think rigorous trials have to be done. But one thing um, that uh, that's lost, I think, in these trials is uh, who, you know, to think about the basic biology of metformin, like who's gonna benefit and who's not gonna benefit. And to get some insight into this, uh, we did a CRISPR screen to figure out what genes would make you resistant uh, in vitro to metformin. And the screen was the following screen. We took uh, A549 cells, which are sensitive to metformin in culture, uh, and we uh, basically uh, put in a library of 30,000 small guide RNAs. So 3,000 genes, 10 guide RNAs per gene. And these are 3,000 genes that are related to metabolism somehow. Right, so autophagy, mTOR, uh, all the mitochondrial genes, all the glycolytic genes, lipids, et cetera, nucleotides. Uh, it's, and um, so you knock out all these genes and then we switched them to galactose media, all right? So when you switch them from glucose to galactose, they're, they're surviving purely on mitochondrial function 
and, and they're doing very little glycolysis. We gave metformin, and this really now causes rapid cell death. Right? And we just asked what survives, right? The top hit that conferred resistance to metformin was the metformin transporter. And that was very gratifying, right? You lose the metformin transporter, the cells don't care. You can give them one millimolar, 10 millimolar, 100 millimolar metformin. It ain't getting in, right? So I would say, just like with Herceptin, we look at HER2 positive uh, uh, breast cancers, perhaps any clinical trials with metformin should look at the organic cation transporter family. So there's OCT1, 2, and 3. Any one of the three can, can, um, can transport metformin. And probably one of, you know, I think there was a sort of almost magic realism or fantasy that we all had. Uh, we could find a magic bullet of any cancer cell that it, they're so dependent on an enzyme and we can target that enzyme and cure cancer that way uh, with a therapeutic window, et cetera, right? And obviously I don't think this is gonna work out and it hasn't worked out. And then we have to go back to doing exactly what everybody else is doing in cancer therapy is first, stratify patients to see who would benefit, right? Based on driver mutations, this might, you know, diagnostic imaging tumor microenvironment, or simply ask who is, for example, OCT3 positive, who, which, you know, if you're gonna give metformin as your metabolism therapy, patients stratify by organic cation three or one or two, right? right? The metformin transporters, and then figure out which one is best, chemo, radio, immunotherapy. And really this patient stratification based on the usual stuff, driver mutation, et cetera, thinking about what's the best targeting, is it metformin, is it nucleotide synthesis, DHDH, maybe it's diet, um, and then you know, figuring out the right combination. And this is what my lab is now really trying to do, is to figure out this combination uh, and finding a, which can be tolerated uh, and then... Um, uh, and move it into the clinic. I think there was a great two studies recently in preclinical models where they use MEK inhibitors and the MEK inhibitors, they showed decreased uh, mitochondrial respiration as well as glycolysis. And those cells then became very addicted to autophagy, right? Because they're being starved of glycolysis and TCA cycle function. And so they have to rely on autophagy uh, for growth and survival. And MEK inhibition with autophagy and a, lot, and a variety of KRAS uh, tumors, at least in preclinical models, was quite remarkable, and this is now being moved into patients. So that's the kind of, you know, the oncogene was KRAS. Uh, the, it was the standard of care in this case was MEK inhibition, and, um, and autophagy was sort of their metabolic inhibitor as one example. Okay, in, um, the, in about the last sort of 10, 12 minutes, uh, I wanna finish uh, at 8.45, so I give at least 10 minutes for uh, Q&A. Uh, we've been thinking like everybody else uh, about immune cells, right? Harnessing uh, tumor immunity to kill, um, to kill cancer cells. And uh, again, same sort of simple questions. Go back to the drawing board and ask simply, why do immune cells respire, in particular T cells? And uh, we did the same simple genetic experiments. We've got our uh, conditional knockouts of mitochondrial complex three. Uh, we can do it with the CD4 Cree. And years ago, we did this. Uh, Laura Senna, we published this almost seven, eight years ago. And what she noticed was that if you knock out complex three in T cells, and you uh, put them in lymphopenic mice, so they homostatically expand. They did fine, and she was super disappointed by this result. But if she ran it through a variety of antigen models, and they didn't respond to antigens at all, right? And that was quite gratifying. So if you take a complex three knockout T cells, else, again in vivo at baseline, there's quite a, you know they develop fine, and um, they have, there's plenty of these complex three. T cells uh, floating around, they just don't respond um, and mount a, excuse me, a, a, in a response to an antigen, right? Uh, and uh, we're still trying to figure out the molecular details, even seven years later, it's been quite challenging exactly why that is. And we've got a whole slew of new mouse models 
um, to dissect what's missing in, uh, from the TCA cycle or electron transport chain. That uh, is it all nucleotides, perhaps? Um, uh, why they don't respond to antigen? Uh, so Sam Weinberg, a talented MD PhD, wanted to know about Tregs because you know Tregs we think in many ways are sort of the gatekeepers of tumor immunity. Uh, if you can knock out Treg function, you can really uh, allow um, you know sort of PD one or or other therapies to work better. And we've seen this in our own hands. So what's happening with Tregs? Same sort of thing. Instead of CD4 Cre, we're using FoxP3 Cre. Now we can do it both inducibly, uh, also the one that gets activated in development. And again, Sam got a spectacular result here, right? It, uh, if you knock out the RISP, uh, the mice are dead. If you do it with the other allele QPCs, and remember both RISP or QPC are complex three subunits. We're knocking out the same complex, same genetics, they look identical. And uh, naturally, Sam was super excited. Uh, big phenotype. It looked like a FOXP3 null mice or the, the immunologist, um, you know, like a scurfy mice, widespread immunity. FOXP3 is the, is the transcription factor, which uh, confers identity to uh, Tregs. And, you know, in my lab, I have a simple experiment when a student or a postdoc comes running with a spectacular result. I always ask them, other than in cancer, in primary cells, a very simple um, uh, experiment I wanna, want them to do follow-up. Are the cells there, right? If the Tregs aren't there, if they're all dead, I think that most of you would be like, what's it, duh, I could have told you that. The Tregs need mitochondria for ATP and survival. I don't, you know, that's not an interesting explanation. Luckily, when Sam looked into this, what he found was, as the, if you use the classical Treg markers, you know FoxP3 positive, CD25 positive, CTLA positive, those numbers were identical, right? And that was super exciting. That meant they the cells aren't dead. And, and more importantly, if you take the cells out and you look at an activation marker, CD44 or KI67, a proliferative index, they look identical, right? So that tells us in the absence of complex three, Tregs maintain their proliferation, their survival. You know, they figured a way to grow and they clearly use glycolysis for the ATP, right? So the only thing that was left to do was to look at whether they are functional. They're there, but are they functional? So what's their main job of Tregs? Their main job is to be suppressive cells, right? To suppress inflammation. And you can do a lot of assays to test this. One of the classic ones is where you put them in a RAG deficient mouse, a mouse that has no T cells. So you can put in wild type T effector cells. So these are the inflammatory cells and they'll get colitis and the mice die. You can do the control experiment that many people in the field have done where you give T effector cells. So these are inflammatory cells along with some Treg cells at the same time. And because you have enough Treg cells with the effector cells, you get no, uh, you get no colitis, you get no, uh, uh, no death, right? Because of Tregs, the wild type Tregs is control inflammation. What if you gave wild type T effector cells, which by themselves cause rapid uh, colitis and uh, autoimmunity here, and you give the knockout Tregs, the same levels as the wild type, they look indistinguishable uh, to the wild type of effector cells. It's, it's like we didn't even give them any. Of course we did. We gave them the same amount, alive Tregs. But that just meant these Tregs are not able to conduct their suppressive function. The other experiment we did is a tumor immunity one. These are B16 in uh, uh, melanomas as they grow rapidly. Uh, and uh, what Sam did is uh, he put him on a tamoxifen and, and then he just injected tamoxifen. And, and again, you're only ablating in, uh, t uh, complex three function in T-Rex, nowhere else, right? right? And by doing that, uh, we completely uh, abolish uh, uh, tumor growth. I have to say, I find this, uh, you know, again, you have to forgive me for to the immunologists. Uh, I'm not an immunologist. I, you know, read many of your papers uh, and trying to learn. But, but all we're doing is we're knocking out 
T-reg, uh, uh, complex strain T-regs. Those T-regs, uh, are they survive in the absence of complex three. They're metabolically active. They're taking up tons of glucose in a tumor microenvironment. But once you knock out their T-reg function, it unleashes the cytotoxic T cells to come in and wipe out these tumors, right? All the other, you know, there's all sorts of mechanisms around metabolic insufficiency of T cells, of cytotoxic T cells, et cetera. I mean, you know, you get rid of these Treg uh, complex three, everything else is restored and boom, the tumors are gone. Uh, this is not only uh, in B16, we've used uh, KRAS uh, P53 null lung adenocarcinoma cells, right? These are the ones that Tyler Jackson's lab made 20 years ago, uh, mouse models of lung cancer. Same thing happens. And uh, you can use MC38. So in other words, this is not unique to B16, a variety of different. And again, this is something I'm very excited about trying to figure out how this is all happening. So mechanistically, and again, this was published a while back. Um, again, what's happening? These Tregs are there, but why are they not able to uh, uh, conduct suppressive function? And again, the reason is when we look at by metabolomics, there's tons of L2AG when complex three is not there. Right, And if you look at DNA methylation, key loci are hypermethylated due to the L2AG, and those genes are downregulated, including a variety of key suppressive genes, TIGID, PD-1, et cetera. Right? Uh, and so the major role is that mitochondria have to continuously maintain this ratio so they prevent L2AG from being generated, uh, because if L2AG is generated, it will prevent Treg's ability to suppress. Yes. And, uh, and again, more work to be done, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it really highlights that mitochondria in cancer, it's all about uh, growth. But in normal cells, stem cells, T cells, T regs, is really about maintaining cell fate and cell function, perhaps through molecules like L2HG. Again, the big take home message uh, most of you took your biochemistry classes, uh, were brought up, uh, the powerhouse of the cell is Amita pointing to bioenergetics. Everything is about ATP and survival. I can tell you we've done a lot of genetic experiments, myself, many of my colleagues, um, and uh, uh, in most tissues, we have not seen cell senescence or cell death when we knock out mitochondrial complex three. Glycolysis is sufficient to maintain survival. And I think that's quite profound if you really think about it. In some settings like cancer, the predominant function is to generate metabolites for growth. And in many normal cells, whether they're proliferative like certain stem cells or Tregs or primary cells like, like a heart, for example, is really for cellular fader function, right? It's not for survival. Uh, and uh, trying to figure out exactly what these particular signals that the mitochondria releases. Um, I think someone's uh, mic is on. Okay, this happens, it's okay. Um, but, but again, um, uh, the exciting part for us is uh, really to think about this. This is a big take home message. Uh, what I think most of you can appreciate is you can go back and think of your own system, whatever that is, right? Macrophages, myeloid, the brain, et cetera. Uh, and the mitochondria clearly somehow related to cellular state and function in any given cell. And you can start to think about epigenetics and, and gene expression and signaling pathways and what signals mitochondria are releasing. During, very analogous to thinking about transcription factors, right? right? Transcription factors sort of determine cell state and function. We think mitochondria work the same way by being on top of those transcriptional uh, transcription factors and transcription load. That's a hypothesis that still needs to you know, be flushed out, but this is what I continue to be excited about. Uh, Amita mentioned I wrote a book a few years ago. Um, most of my colleagues thought this was crazy, particularly 
given the fact that I'm still in, I guess, in middle age. Uh, and this is something you do a little bit later in life uh, when you have a little bit maybe more time and can reflect. But I thought uh, there were so many people interested in metabolism and the great biochemistry books, which are still wonderful, um, didn't perhaps capture the beauty of metabolism with cell biology. So I wrote a very simplistic book called Navigating Metabolism, a cheap plug. Uh, but I think this is a book that's... Uh, for those who are just interested in how metabolism links to cell biology. In many ways, this doesn't, this book isn't uh, there to take away the great Leninger books. Uh, in many ways, it's sort of for the Twitter generation, right? It's 140 characters worth of book. Um, everything you want to know metabolism, but uh, distilled in, in simple pictures. The best part of the book is this, P. Jeff's illustrations. Almost you can look at the illustrations and you can understand what metabolism is about. Uh, and, uh, I'm delighted it's translated in Japanese. I hope someone would do it in Chinese. That way I can actually make a little money off the book. But uh, anyways, thank you, Amita. And I uh, look forward to um, uh, the q and I think we've got, I'm right on time, 8.45. So thank you. Should we open it for questions now? Yes, that'd be great. Hi, this is Mike Farrar. I've got a question about the last section. Um, I'm wondering how much, do you know much more with regard to detail about what's going wrong with the suppressor mechanisms in these T-regs? I mean, you mentioned PD-1 and TIGIT, which I don't really think of as things that are really going to cause suppression by the T-regs, but things like, do they fail to make cytokines like IL-10? You said they express CD25 and CTLA-4, which are primary mechanisms. So it doesn't seem like those are involved okay. unless CTLA-4 doesn't get to the surface. Do they not make TGF beta? Do they not make PDL1 or IDO? Is, is anything more known about what's underlying this? Because that would be really interesting. Wonderful, wonderful question. So we started exactly as you pointed out, CD25, CTLA4. That's not it. Okay. FOXP3, anything related to that? That's not it. I just mentioned TG, TG, PD1, and a few other ones just because uh, uh, when you knock them out, I mean, you know, to be honest, and you're absolutely right, the genetics tells you that it doesn't look like this. In fact, the mice live quite a long time and they slowly develop um, autoimmunity. Um, I actually don't know. All the conventional mechanisms you mentioned, uh, and I'm happy to send you the paper and you can take a look at some of the gene loci that we found that were downregulated, if they make sense. I have no, uh, I have no good explanation other than the canonical mechanisms that have been out in the literature are, are not the ones uh, that uh, hmm. we found. I'll tell you the best experiment we did, and I, I want to really thank Larry Trucker for this one. And he said, you know, now the FOXP3s on the Y chromosome, you can do sort of genetics where you can get chimeric mice, where half of them are going to be wild type and half of them in the same mouse are the knockouts. And in that model, there's no inflammation, right? Because the wild type Tregs control it. And so now you can, and you know, with markers, you can isolate the wild type versus the complex three in the same microenvironment, the same mouse, and then we ran RNA-seq. So you, we really got the cell autonomous, non-inflamed uh, gene expression profile. And there was a set of genes that were downregulated. And I had off the top of my head, I don't remember, but many of them were not what you would consider the canonical ones you mentioned. Hmm. And, and that's in the paper? That's in the paper. Okay. If you email me, I, I, I mean, I'm happy to have a Zoom call. Sure, I can look it up. Because you know a lot more about it than I do. We're doing other experiments around it, obviously, to try to figure out. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's some profound things ah. we found in, the, in that thing. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that uh, wonderful uh, question. Uh, really appreciate it. This is uh, Khalil Ahmed. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yes. Uh, I did a wonderful talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, my, uh, I have two questions. One is... Um, that, uh, you know, the excess of hydrogen peroxide is also uh, damaging to the cells. Uh, you know, the, it, it's been, you know, suggested to induce cell death. So my first question is, uh, what regulates the level of H2O2 in mitochondria in particular? And my uh, second question was is going to be that uh, calcium plays a major role in the uh, integrity of mitochondria. And I was wondering how calcium changes in cancer cells, uh, you know, would affect the uh, 
metabolic activity in 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 your scheme uh, of uh, thinking excellent questions let me answer the first one real quick um so we have we we've come more and more uh, to the conclusion that h2o2 under most situations uh is a positive signaling beneficial physiologic molecule when iron gets deregulated uh, h2o2 becomes hydroxyl radicals when polyunsaturated fatty acids are around you can generate a lipid hydroperoxide and, and get ferroptosis so the good uh, so-called the good ROS in our minds is largely H2O2 coming from mitochondria. The bad is when that H2O2 becomes a lipid hydroperoxide to induce ferroptosis. What controls that H2O2 is largely the mitochondrial membrane potential uh, 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 as, a, as sort of a rheostat. Uh, uh. The second question was around calcium. You know, Calcium as entry from the cytoplasm into the mitochondria to then increase electron transport chain function in TCA, uh, and which would then make H2O2 is my favorite idea. And I think this is what you're alluding to. There's a big problem with that hypothesis now. Uh, after the discovery of the mitochondrial calcium uniporter, uh, the MCU, Many people have knocked out MCU in the brain, in T cells, in many systems, no phenotype. So that's not to say that MCU is not important. I think under certain contexts it is. It's not clear to me under what those contexts are. So it was one of my favorite theories and we've actually published a little bit with pharmacological inhibitors of the MCU and calcium, but I'm not convinced less and less that the role of calcium in mitochondria. Thank you. I have a feeling that uh, cancer cells kind of adapt better to calcium level. Yeah, these are all primary cells. Yeah. Uh, that was, the cancer cells, you know, anything goes as you're suggesting. But, uh, but to see it in, with genetics in vivo with primary cells. Thank you. I wonder if your pulps, who were mice who had race mutation or QPC mutation, when they grow, do they have any reproductive problems? We have not looked at that. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's interesting you mentioned that there's quite a bit of literature more and more on mitochondria and, and reproduction. Um, we, we, we haven't done anything related to mitochondrial function. Uh, what I will say is that the metabolite, uh, L2-hydroxyglutarate, uh, sperm tends to have a lot of LDHC, which generates a lot of L2-hydroxyglutarate. So I actually think L2-hydroxyglutarate might be an important uh, metabolite, uh, and we're testing that, uh, obviously, in, uh, in that context only. But other than that, we haven't done anything in reproduction. And in terms of clinical practice, it's obviously based on your research for glycolysis uh, inhibitors, this is not really good uh, drugs because the most resistant cells will survive and adjust to oxidative phosphorylation, yes. So do you think, and same will happen with oxidative phosphorylation inhibitor. Some cells will adjust and will be resistant. Any combination of additional factors, what you think might improve efficiency of both of these inhibitors? Yeah, so, so um, I can't comment on glycolysis, but I can tell you with the, uh, with the mitochondrial inhibitors, I think the key is to figure out how they work best with immunotherapy or radiation therapy. Thank you. So can you get them to be radiosensitizers? In fact, you can, right? So if you inhibit electron transport chain, like complex one, what happens is that cancer cells don't use oxygen. If they don't use oxygen, the local hypoxia is alleviated. Local hypoxia is alleviated, guess what? Radiotherapy works a lot better, more oxygen, right? So Nick Danko's got some nice work with complex one inhibitors uh, being good radio sensitizers, right? That's one example. Obviously the other one would be somehow inhibiting, you know, mitochondrial function in Tregs would then combine with PD-1 better, uh, analogous to our Treg stuff. Thank you. I think the key is, find that 
therapeutic window and the right combination. Um, you know, if I, this should be really one of my take home slides. Oh, I just, sorry. Yeah. Uh, am I not? Oh, this one right here, All right? Figuring out this combination. Okay. Thank you, excellent. Any more questions? Because I, if there's not- Yeah, I have one. Um, very nice talk, uh, this is Leo Fur. Thank you. Um, uh, it was very exciting. Um, a question for you. I seem to, re it's not an area I follow, but I, I go, Otto Warburg is a god in my world because it's some of the first work I read as a cancer researcher. Right. Um, uh, so I seem to recall some anecdotes about um, mitochondria and aging and the number of them. Mm. Is, has any uh, work done on that about uh, throughout life from uh, youngsters up through aged relative to the end of mitochondria? Right. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, this is a question I'm obviously deeply interested in, as is the field. So here's a surprise. When we conditionally knock out mitochondrial complex one, whole body early in development with a catalytic subunit of complex one, so zero function, okay? The mouse dies in utero, not a surprise. The bigger surprise is go to 50% from birth, heterozygous. You can imagine three outcomes, let, I mean, let them age, right? Get them to 24, 28, 30 months, et cetera. And during that time, do behavioral tests, rotor rod, grip strength, LCMB infection, just weight gain, glucose tolerance, right? You could just health span assays as a function of time, longitudinally. You can imagine you get three, three outcomes, nothing. They would be severely compromised at 12 months or 18 months, right? Because they're starting out with less. Or somehow there's some sort of rheostatic, homeostatic mechanisms that made them more resilient. The opposite, they did better. Sadly, five years later, <laughs> lots of mice, nothing completely neutral, right? So you and I and the rest of us are born with excess capacity, yeah. right? We're not rate limited. And so, uh, so we have three models now of the same subunit, of the same complex one, 50%, 70, 80% decrease or 100% decrease. 100% decrease, you're not born. 70, 80%, you get a childhood syndrome called Lee syndrome mitochondrial uh, mutate, you know, mitochondrial disease, right? Uh, these kids die a couple of years, the mice die around day 50. They're born, they look normal, but then they progressively degenerate. With 50%, totally fine. So there's a threshold effect, right? And now, I think a key question in the field is, do, does anyone, include anyone here, reach to that threshold ever? Right? Do you reach to a threshold where mitochondria become rate limiting for normal aging or normal yep. health span? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I don't think so because I look at all the biopsy data of mitochondrial function, all that stuff, at least with respect to electron, there, there could be other aspects of mitochondria perhaps, but not the classical electron transport because it, the data is like 30 to 50% usually and people make a big deal out of it. Oh, look, mitochondria are down by 30%. Ergo, they're related to Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, I was just going to go there because I, I know people have looked at uh, 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 in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I don't know what the recent data is on this, but uh, it's, it's fascinating work, uh, obviously. So thank you again for your great talk. Thank you. Thank you very okay, much. we are going to close this as we have 9 a.m. meetings to attend with Dr. Chandel. Dr. Ken, um, Kelly Carr is going to go to class and teach. So we will see everybody next week. Be well. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir.